All right. Oh, yeah, I love this evolution of languages. This is the best. This is the best. All right, so how? Oh, oh, we're not on. We're not on. I am recording, though. How long would you have let me do this before, like, babble without a, something on the screen before you would have told me? I mean, that guy's patching Grand Theft Auto right now, I can tell. Oh, yeah, I get defensive. It's cool. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Uh, so, how did we get to where we are today? And I like to do this by drawing a picture. So we're going to start off way back here. And this is roughly 1968-ish. All right, how many of you were around in 1968? All right, so we have the C programming language. Now, the C programming language was a language originally designed for writing operating systems, specifically the Unix operating system, which came out about the same time. C is a procedural language. So let's write that to the side of it here. Procedural. All right. Which means that C did not have things like objects. So if we kind of talk about this a little bit, call this evolution of C. C had variables. Now it's a strongly typed language. C was strongly typed, so when you defined variables, you had to say what kind of thing it was built to hold, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it had variables. We had um, something called uh, arrays. So arrays are, so a variable is um, a single value. So it's something capable of holding a single value. An array is a collection of like values. C also had something called a struct, which is a collection of unlike values. Okay. C also supported procedures and functions. Um, procedures were things that did not return a value. Functions were things that did return a value. But these are kind of like a repeatable tasks, like a chunk of code that we can ex we can write once and then call multiple times. Okay, supported those guys uh, separately. Now, again, this is a procedural language. Now, we might say a couple minutes ago we were talking about. A couple minutes ago, we were uh, talking about the idea of the procedural telephone versus the object-oriented telephone, and one of the things we bumped into there was this idea that, well, why would we ever design a telephone to just be a pile of wires, right? Doesn't make any sense to us today. Now, gut feeling. Do you think the programs that we were writing for computers in 1968 were more or less complex than the programs we're writing for computers today? You think they were more complex back then? Well, probably the other way around. I mean, our computers were far less powerful, right? 1968 computer, not quite up to snuff with today's computers, right? We didn't have the memory. We didn't have the processing power. We didn't have the, uh, well, we didn't have the programming languages. We didn't have the graphics. We didn't, we didn't have anything. So the problems that we could conceive of in 1968 were probably pretty trivial problems compared to what we conceive of today with computers. Make sense? So when we were originally writing software for computers, 
So there were languages before C. I like to start this discussion with C because all of our modern languages came from C. So I'm kind of showing you kind of the root language and how we got to where we are. So there were languages before C, but you know, the days back then when we were writing uh, uh, software, the problems we were solving did not dictate that we needed something more complex than C. We didn't think about things like objects because we didn't run into a need for them. Does that make sense? So we solved all the problems we could with C. We did that for many years. And then all of a sudden, as computers got a little bit faster, and as memory got a little bit bigger, and as human beings started buying into this whole, hey, computers can do cool stuff for us. And then we started using our imagination and coming up with new things we might want a computer to do for us. We started noticing some weaknesses in procedural languages. You know, we started saying, you know, it would be really nice if I could hold a couple of values, but also have the thing do something. So an example of this would be, let's say in, let's, the, let's do it this way. Let's say in C, we wanted to store a person's first name and a person's last name. And then we also wanted to have the ability to print their full name to the screen, all right? To do that in C, we would have to do something along these lines. This capitalization is gonna screw with me here, but whatever. All right, so I would create a structure that can hold a couple of values. In this case, they happen to be the same kind of values. If I wanted to also put in an age, I can say uh, p dot age is equal to 20. Birthday's not till Friday. All right, so now I uh, this is compatible with what I said, where it can hold a collection of values that are not necessarily alike. All right, so we have a struct that knows how to hold a first name, a last name, and an age. So I created a variable of type person. So this is a strongly typed language. And then I set that person's first name to Mike, his last name to Littman, and his age to 20, my current age until Friday. All right, but now I want to have the ability to display Mike's name, all right? What we would have to have is we'd have to have a function. Let me write this, uh, actually, we'll, let's do it this way. We'll say func Something actually, we, we want to go full geek on this. Something along those lines where uh, we've defined our struct. Let me shrink this down a little bit so it fits on the screen. So this is what a person looks like. Here's a specific person. So I create a variable capable of holding a person, then put some information related to that specific person. And then I have this function here that if I pass a person to this function, it will take that person, whatever person I passed in, I could have just as easily made this guy called Q. 
it didn't have to be named the same as this. So we'll talk about functions, so don't get too caught up on that right now. So whatever person I pass into this display function, it'll print out that person's first name and last name. So percent %s is a placeholder for a string. So this guy will become p.f name. This second one will become p.l name. So this will, in this particular case, would print out Mike Lippman. I would have to say this. I would have to say um, display p like that in order for it to actually show the Mike Lippman. That makes sense? So this is what you would have had to do in C. Now the issue is, is we wouldn't call this overly complex, but one problem we have with this is it would kind of be nice for us to have this function live inside of our person struct. It would be nice for us to say a person has a first name, they have a last name, they have an age, and a person can also announce themselves. They can display themselves, we ask them to. It would be nice for me to be able to do something like this, for me to say p dot display. C doesn't let you do that. Okay, C didn't have a facility for storing inside of structs functions or procedures. All a struct could hold was variables. So it was a weakness. Okay. We really needed a better container. Remember when we talked about the difference between a procedural and an object-oriented language? We need a better container, something that can hold all those wires, but also then we could poke a couple holes out to have our public interfaces there. So the C++ version of this would look like that. This is an object-oriented language. This is a procedural language. So object-oriented language, we change the word struct to the word class. And classes now know how to hold variables, and they also know how to hold functions and procedures, where structs only knew how to hold variables. This is a better container. Make sense? All right, so if we're gonna, I'm gonna steal this slide. We'll paste this slide. So when we say evolution of C++, we still had variables, we still had arrays, we actually still did have structs, but we introduced a class. This is a collection of variables functions, procedures, and actually something called a constructor, constructors as well. Okay, don't worry about that right now. So C to C++, we introduced a container. The ability to put procedures and functions and variables inside of one basket. We didn't have to do that all the time. We could still write procedural code in C++, but if we ran into a problem where object-oriented programming was needed, it would make sense not to just have an ugly pile of wires sitting there, but instead, let's stuff all those details inside of an object. We still have to write them. As a programmer, we still have to go through the, the, the headache of implementing that telephone. Okay? But once we get it right, once the telephone works, we can take all those wires that we're not gonna to have to use on a daily basis and we can shove them inside of the box so that what we have sitting in front of us is an object with only the parts of that object that we actually need to use on a daily basis exposed to us. And all those details that we spent time and energy creating, hidden away from us, within reach if we had to get to them, but not just exposed to us. And the, the, the benefit of that is, if somebody says, hand me the phone, you could pick up a phone and hand it to somebody. The procedural phone, though, you're 
dragging a bunch of wires over to them. It's not convenient, right? So it's tough to pass around a whole bunch of wires. That's the difference between C and C++. All right. Now, so let's go ahead and let's throw C++ onto our picture here. Um, I don't have the date for C++. Let's get that real quick. Guessing 76 maybe. Come on. You got this. Uh, 1983. All right, so C++, 1983. Many years later, but kind of around the time when, you know, the problems we were trying to solve started getting a little bit more complex. We started running into some of those limitations of C. All right. Let me steal this. Paste another thing in here. Evolution of Java. Java kept the variables. They kept the arrays. They dumped structs. All right. Now, Java made a mistake. They made a mistake. Um, for starters, let's, let's go back here. What are the problems with C++? Why wasn't, I mean, if we're still using object-oriented languages today, why didn't we just stop at C++? Why wasn't that just good enough? Well, C++, still a popular language today. It's not a bad language. In fact, actually, the, the issues with C++ deals with learning C++. So C++, I usually say something like, empowered the programmer to make poor decisions. All right, let me give you an example of this. Again, you were telling me about this party you're having tomorrow night, right? All right, and uh, you're going to invite me to the party. Now, when you say the party is at my place tonight, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow at 830, do you hand me your house and tell me to open the door at 8.30? No. Or do you give me the address of where I can find your house? No. Why? Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? Houses are heavy. Okay, Even little tiny houses. You've seen the TV shows, tiny homes. Okay, Those are heavy too. Okay? Houses are too big to just hand to somebody. We don't hand out houses. Okay? We give you a little piece of paper. With the address on it, right? Say, show up here tomorrow at 8.30. Okay, and then we plug it into our GPS and we show up there and everybody's happy. Okay, especially if you're going to invite more than one person to your house. You can't hand that house to multiple people, right? It, it doesn't make any sense in real life. And remember, I mentioned that one of the things that we do as programmers, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a number out there. I'm going to say about 85% of the time when we solve problems when we solve problems as a programmer, we're solving them in identical ways to how we would solve problems in real life. If we were going to give somebody a house object in a, in a programming language, we would very likely want to give them the address where they can find that in the computer's memory rather than give them the giant house object. Now, giant's all in the eyes of the beholder, right? You know, in real life, we're thinking, okay, well, a house weighs thousands of pounds. Okay, well, yeah, how big is uh, one of our person objects that we just looked at? Okay, it's, you know, it's 64 bytes big or something like that. That's not that big in our world right now, you know, because we have 16 gigs of RAM or something like that in our computers. But once upon a time, that wasn't the case, okay? But the point is, is that an object is, is, is substantial, right? Objects weigh something. 
So chances are when we give somebody an object, we want to tell them where they can find it in the computer's memory and not hand them the object, period. Okay, the reason I like using the house thing is because, like I said, 85% of the time, the way we solve problems is going to be identical to the way we solve them in real life. Um, every now and then, real life doesn't line up to how we need to solve it in a computer. Or, or because we have the flexibility as a programmer to do something different than real life, sometimes we can make, take advantage of that. But for us right now, we should probably operate under this assumption that we should always attempt to solve the problem identically to how we would solve it in real life, okay? And in real life, you would never hand somebody your house. You would always give them the address to where the house is. C++ would allow the programmer to decide, am I gonna give you the house or am I gonna give you the address of the house, okay? The difference would look like something like this. If you had a house object, Let's just assume it already had a value in it. Actually, this would be a... Um, that would actually be a house pointer like that. So if I said H, that's the address. Star H would be the actual house. Okay, and I'll show you some of this when we actually get into some of the programming stuff probably next class. But um, in C++, we have a, a syntax given to us that allows us to specify, do I mean the address or do I mean the, the, the value? Okay, so if we're an inexperienced programmer and we don't know any better, we might use the, the wrong syntax. And that wrong syntax could lead to um, very bad programming. In the, the best case, your programs are just very large because you are passing everything around by value. Um, you're passing around houses instead of addresses as houses. But in a worst case, you might be handing memory off to something and changing that memory, not thinking you were changing that memory because you didn't know any better. Does that make sense? So. C++ is a little bit of a dangerous language to, uh, um, to kind of learn on. Okay. Especially in the old days when you, uh, uh, your C++ compilers were not run inside of, uh, um, uh, were not run inside of virtual machines. Where if you ran a program in C++ that rode over some of your operating system memory, you had to reboot your computer. Start over. Hope you saved your program. Okay, it's, <laughs> you could literally crash your computer. Now, with that in mind, something to add to our list here. There are two kinds of programming languages. We have interpreted and we have compiled. Interpreted languages tend to be relatively slow. Compiled languages tend to be relatively fast. Interpreted languages run through something called an interpreter. Compiled languages use something called a compiler. So interpreted languages are interpreted in real time while the program is running. Compiled languages are translated into, let's call it machine code, actually translated into a low level language prior to running the program so that when it runs, it is on a one-to-one -one basis with the CPU. Hence, faster. So we compile a program once, and then every single time we run it, it runs fast because it's every line of code in a compiled program 
is one instruction, one magic trick on the CPU. An interpreter program gets translated in real time every single time we run it. So this is no different than, uh, um, you know, if you're listening to somebody on TV speaking English and they have a translator that's translating into a different language, well, they're listening to the person speaking English and with a couple of second delay, they're spitting it out in German. Make sense? It's, there's a delay. Still get the message across, but it's not speedy. As opposed to them sending the speech over an hour ahead of time, letting the news place convert the speech from English to German, and then in real time they're reading the German version of the speech uh, to the audience while the English-speaking guy is babbling on at the same time. Does that make sense? That's faster. So we have this tool with that in mind called a compiler. Okay. Compiler is a fancy name for a program that converts a high-level language into a low-level language. Ooh. That's it. That's what it does. So it takes our Java or our C++ or our C and it turns it into assembly code so that we don't have to write it. So when we write the Java version of the Hello World program on Linux and we compile it, ultimately it's going to turn into this guy. The compiler builds that. Make sense? So that we didn't have to write it. All right, so problem with C++ is it gave us a lot of power, but for an inexperienced programmer, somebody who didn't necessarily know what they were doing, it kind of lets you get into trouble, all right? With, with little, little good reason. So when we come back to Java, we kept variables, we kept arrays, we got rid of structs. Why? Java decided, incorrectly, I might add, that you know what? The difference between a struct, which is just a collection of values, and a class, which is a collection of values plus functions or procedures, is, isn't a struct actually a class that we choose not to put functions and procedures in? Couldn't I write a class? Couldn't I do this? Uh, we had our example here. Couldn't I have this person class in C++ and just choose? not to put a function in there. Isn't that guy the same as a struct now? Doesn't this here look the same as this over here, except the word struct has been replaced with the word class? So aren't they the same thing? They look the same. They are almost the same thing. So very, 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 very close except for one huge, life-changing problem that Java didn't seem to notice. Let me put this back so we have it in our example. One of the reasons that we replaced C++, and re replace is the wrong term, because we still use it today, but one of the reasons we introduced a language like Java is that uh, um, programmers could get into trouble because they didn't necessarily know what they were doing. You know, that's going to be common for you. When, you. when you start writing your software in here, I'm going to make it look so easy in front of you. And you're going to go home and you're going to get pissed off because you're going to spend 10 hours working on something and you're going to get nothing but bugs and it's going to yell at you and it's never going to work and then you're going to text me. You're going to say, you're going to say, Mike, I wrote exactly what you wrote and it doesn't work. And then you're going to show me what you wrote. And it's going to be one of those things where it's almost exactly what I wrote. There's a whole lot of problem in that almost. There's a missing semicolon here. There's an extra curly brace here. Little tiny things that turn into big problems. All right. So until you're an experienced programmer that's been doing this for a while, you're going to make errors. Okay? I like to look at programming kind of like it's a sport. Okay. Several of you said you play sports in here. Soccer, cricket, things like that. How many of you are soccer players? I like to use that as an example. Anybody a soccer player in here? 
Tennis player? Tennis. Okay. Ten are, you, are you a good tennis player? Okay. Uh, anybody good at a sport? Or consider themselves pretty good at a sport? Even cricket. You good at cricket? Okay, you're good at cricket. Okay. How long have you been playing cricket? Since I was uh, 10. 10. So, like, like two years. Yeah. All right. Two years. Okay. Almost. All right. So, you've been playing cricket for many years. Now, so you consider yourself pretty good at cricket now. When you first started cricket, were you good? No, you, you, you sucked, right? Okay. Now, you probably had somebody who was teaching you, right? Okay. Yeah, you watched it a lot. You knew a whole lot about it, right? You academically knew how to do different things in cricket. But just because you knew what you were supposed to do, you couldn't actually do it till you practiced the whole bunch, right? The spirit was willing. Okay? <laughs> but things didn't quite work out. Uh, I used to play pretty close to professional tennis uh, years ago, and I broke my back, and then I got fat. So that's kind of the story there. Uh, but it led me to be a pretty good golfer, so it worked out okay. But when I first started playing tennis, you know, you would swing and you'd miss. And my brother and I thought it was cool just to try to hit the ball with the fence. You know, we were, we were like three years old, because right? my dad used to play professional tennis. So we were, as soon as we were old enough to hold a racket, he had a racket in our hands, right? But even though, you know, my dad would sit there and say, okay, well, this is how you, I'm, left, I'm a left-handed person. So even though this is how you hit a forehand, he would say, oh, you got to hold it this way, you do that. We would still you know, grab it with two hands and, <laughs> and swing and miss. Because we were beginners. And even though we understood what he was trying to tell us, until we screwed up a bunch of times, we practiced a bunch of times, it didn't start, we didn't start catching on, right? Programming's like that. You're going to spend hours doing stuff now that later on you'll be able to do in a couple of minutes. And what you're going to end up doing is you're going to find out a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't work. And you're going to learn a whole lot more from your mistakes than you will from your successes. Make sense? So really try to think about programming like it's a sport. Because they promise you most of you are going to struggle with it. That's okay. You're supposed to. But if you don't put in the time, you just say, oh, well, I'm just not good at this. I promise you, you'll never get good at it. If you put in the time, there's a much, much, much better chance that you'll become competent. Now, having said that, you still have the flip side, right? You know, you could take up tennis and it just might not be your sport, right? You know, you, you could I practice 10 hours a day for three and a half years and I can't hit a ball. At that point, you might want to rethink your life. Maybe becoming a professional tennis player just isn't in the cards, right? So I'm not promising you that every one of you is going to become a great programmer. But I can promise you that you won't if you don't put the effort in. Make sense? All right. So, But do try to think about programming kind of like it's a sport. It's not like other subjects where you can just memorize a bunch of crap and then sit down and just regurgitate it. It, it doesn't work that way. Especially since we started off tonight talking about our, we already are all starting off with a big disadvantage. We're people. We're trying to talk to a computer. We're not compatible. Right? We're already at a disadvantage. Right? I'm the closest one to a computer in this room and I'm a weirdo. We've already established that. Right? I'm talking about this stuff like it's, like it's exciting. See, I've, ener I've energized up now, right? I'm awake. I'm awake. We're all awake. We've got 21 minutes left. Plenty of time. <laughs> all right. So, the problem with Java. They made a they made a boo-boo. They made a mistake. They decided, you know what? We're going to go ahead and we're going to get rid of structs. Get rid of those guys right there. Why? Struct. The same thing as a class without methods, class without functions and procedures. In object-oriented languages, those are usually called methods. Don't worry about it. I'll say that again later on. But they got rid of them. There's a problem, though. In these languages, if you have a function and you pass an object to that function, it gets passed by address by default. That's the default way that a object gets passed. So we get the address of it instead of the actual object. So in C++, the programmer would have to erroneously 
say I want to pass the address. I'm sorry, they would have to erroneously say I want to pass the actual house. And remember we talked about that, that C++ empowers the programmer to make bad decisions. The default in C++ as it relates to an object would be the right decision. I have a house here, it's the house for the party. By default, it would be the address of that house. The programmer would have to purposely break it, purposely say, here's the actual house. They'd have to use that extra syntax. So the default for objects is by address, which is good. It's a good thing. But the default for structs is by value. So if we have a struct in C or C++, and I pass that struct to another procedure. I'm giving you the actual thing. Okay, so let's say I have a business card, a struct that's a business card. It has my name uh, and my age and my address on it. Something like that, phone number. Na name and phone numbers on it, that's a business card, right? Age would be weird. I just let everybody know I'm 20. Okay, so, so when I hand somebody a struct, my business card struct, I'm giving them the physical struct, the physical business card. I'm not sending it on some wild goose chase where they can go and find that business card. I'm giving them the actual thing. That's the default behavior for a struct. So even though we can say that an object that chooses not to implement any procedures is the same as a struct, which isn't allowed to implement procedures, if I have an object version of a business card with my name and phone number on it, and I have a struct version of a business card with my name and my phone number on it, and I hand you both of these, you got this guy by value. You got this guy by address. They're not quite identical, okay? Which means that if I hand you the struct version of my business card and you scribbled a note on it, that doesn't affect me at all. But if I handed you the object version of your business card, the business card, you scribbled a note on it, all the rest of the business cards in my pocket just got that note on it. You changed the actual business card because you were manipulating it in memory, not in your pocket. Does that make sense? So it's not quite the same, even though it seems like it was the same. Somebody forgot to tell the people over at Sun Microsystems that. Now it's Oracle, you know, but uh, Java was uh, originally made by Sun Microsystems. Um, so they got rid of structs, what uh, uh, added in, um, uh, well, got rid of structs and um, kept the classes, still had procedures and functions. They did something, um, a lot of Java textbooks will say that uh, we have this idea of something called a pointer. How many of you have heard of pointers before? You haven't had programming before you probably haven't heard of them uh, we're going to be talking about primitive type variables next time but we have this idea of something called a pointer this is a variable type capable of holding a memory address so we can have a variable that knows how to hold an integer. We can have a variable that knows how to hold a string. We can have a variable that knows how to hold a char. We can have one that knows how to hold a memory address. Those are called pointers. In C and C++, we had a special syntax for pointers. We looked at it a few minutes ago, a little asterisk thing. And then you can put an ampersand before it to get the address. So we had a special syntax that empowered us as the programmer to decide whether something was the value or the address of the value. We had those tools available to us. Now, a lot of Java textbooks erroneously, and this is why I don't use a textbook in a lot of my programming classes, uh, a lot of Java textbooks, they uh, erroneously claim that pointers don't exist in Java. That's not true. In Java, they've removed the specific syntax for working with pointers. Java makes all those decisions for you. I mentioned that C++ empowers the programmer to make poor decisions. Java does not empower the programmer 
Instead, Java makes those decisions for you. It's Java's way or the highway. Now, most of the time, the decisions are no-brainers. Like we use the example that it never makes sense to hand somebody a house. We should always give them the address of our house, right? So Java's picking the right, picking the right uh, version there for you, okay? Java always passes objects by address. Java always passes primitive types, which we'll talk about next time, by value. 100% of the time. Um, there's one exception in Java, and I'll talk about that when we talk about strings. It's a special case thing. So it's not that pointers don't exist in Java. It's that we don't have a specific syntax for representing pointers. The reality is most things in Java are pointers to the point where we don't have to have a special syntax. They just are that. All right? So... Java removed the special syntax for pointers. No longer get to specify. It's no longer the programmer's uh, choice. Something is either the address to something else or it's the actual something. And Java makes that decision. And as programmers, when we get used to working with Java, it becomes pretty clear cut. We know that, oh, all of these kinds of things work this way, and all of these kind of things work this way. So we're not surprised. Does that make sense? It's consistent. It is consistent. Um, but if you are coming from an inconsistent world like C and C++, especially as a beginning programmer working in C and C++, where you really kind of just did whatever the hell you wanted, <laughs> and sometimes you didn't even know what you did. Sometimes things would work just by accident. You might have done it in the most inefficient way. You passed somebody the house, but it still worked. Could have just happened to fit inside of memory. Okay, that's like walking up to somebody in real life and handing them their house for the uh, uh, for the party, and they just happened to be a pretty strong person. So, Is there any um, case where that's the better option? Uh, it, there is. That's kind of what I was saying earlier, that 85% thing, where 85% of the time the problems, and I'm just kind of pulling that number out of the sky, but a majority of the time, a strong majority of the time, the way we solve problems in programming will be identical to the way we solve them in real life. Now, every now and then, for example, you might have an object in Java, for example, that you pass to a function. And I've mentioned that objects in Java always pass by address. You always get the address of that guy. So that means if I handed you that object and you scribbled on it, it changed the actual thing in my pocket. Okay? You weren't working with a copy. You were working with the actual thing. Every now and then, I might decide, you know what? I kind of don't want you to break this. I don't really care about the extra memory. I don't care about the weight of the house. I want you to have a copy. <laughs> okay. I want you to have a copy of this guy. You can do whatever you want with this because I don't want you to break the rest of the world. Does that make sense? So we do have a way of accomplishing that in Java. Uh, and it's not overly difficult, but you don't know you have to do it until you understand that it always gets passed by address by default. So what we end up doing in Java is I'm still passing it to you by address, but I'm cloning it first. So I'm coming over here, I got my house, and I'm going to say, okay, here's a new memory address right here. I'm going to clone you. I got two houses now. They look the same, but they're in different places of memory. You can have this one. <laughs> Do whatever you want to it. You're going to ruin this thing in memory here, but it won't impact the original because I made a copy. Does that make sense? But we have to purposely do that. Now, that's not a very common occurrence. I mean, you know, I... If I'm writing software, um, maybe like once a year or something like that, I bump into a situation that kind of maybe makes sense. It's not a real common occurrence, but it does exist. And that's an important thing when you're talking about general purpose languages. You know, you, you, you got to be able to do what you want to do. The benefit of Java over like C and C++ is that more times than not, by a pretty large margin, Java makes the right decision for you. So it's the, it's the uh, exception rather than the rule when you have to make Java behave a little bit less than it does naturally. 
where in C++, it's a free-for-all. You're at the mercy of kind of what the programmer decides to throw in front of their variables. Because when you're learning how to program, throwing asterisks and ampersands in front of things, you might not really know what you're doing. It's like, okay, well, I put it there and it works, so it must be good. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, Once you know what you're doing, you'll know whether it was good or not. It makes sense, but it's a, it's a difficult language to learn with. Um, because you can get into trouble and sometimes you won't know you got into trouble. Because sometimes your code will work, but it worked for all the wrong reasons. Make some sense? All right, so Java removes some of the special syntax stuff. Let's go back and let's throw Java up here. All right, well then, we had our uh, buddies from Microsoft. Um, they uh, came out with a product called uh, J++. Okay. Um, J++ was Java syntax, in, um, uh, but it, using Microsoft tools. Now, here's the issue with these large companies. So we bashed on Apple for a little bit earlier. Now we'll bash on Microsoft a little bit. When you're a big company, it's like that, with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of money, it's often easier to steal something, get sued, settle outside of court, and move on with life. Our laws allow for that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? So let's say you wrote a piece of software. All right? You, you wrote something. You, so you're, you're, you're some kid. You wrote this software. You're in, in your underwear. Okay, you're in your underwear, living in the basement of grandma's house. You wrote some software. Microsoft steals your software. And you go and whine about it. Oh, my God, stop, took my software. And then Microsoft said, look, kid, here's a million dollars. Shut up. What do you say? Thank you. you say, thank you. And you move away. You shut up. And you take your million bucks and you laugh. Because you would have never made a million bucks off of it. Why? Because you don't have Microsoft's resources to promote it. Our world's a little bit different today now that we have these app stores and stuff like that that we can put our software out on. I mean, you go back in some of these early days, I mean, if you were to write software, you had to go through a whole bunch of hoops to get it on like the shelves of Best Buy. That wasn't something that just automatically happened. Now anybody and their brother can put something up on the app store. All right, so generally speaking, these big companies, if they want to steal your crap, they're going to give you more money for it than you're going to be able to get off of it, so you're happy. Right? Please, Microsoft, steal my stuff. Well, unfortunately, the makers of Java, Sun Microsystems, they aren't some kid in his underwear. They were a big tech company. Okay? Um, they were, uh, um, they made computer hardware. They made SunSpark chips as a type of processor. They made uh, computers. And they made this language. In fact, they stood behind this language so much that they made it their ticker symbol on the stock market. So Sun Microsystems uh, ticker symbol, like if you were to invest in it, like Microsoft is MSFT, Apple is APPL, Sun Microsystems was JAVA, Java. Uh, they didn't like the fact that Microsoft stole their stock. So they said, um, no, we're not going to settle outside of court. We're going to sue you. And we're going to let it go to court, and we're going to win, and you're going to have to not use our stuff. And that's what happened. So, Microsoft had to stop using Java stuff, Java syntax in their stuff. And they came out with a language called C Sharp. Now, I was at the... Um, uh, ACM conference at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign when they first announced C Sharp. I wonder, what year was this? This has to be like 2000, 2001. Let's see, when did C Sharp come out? Early 2000s. Oh, did I, did I, did I not hit the Sharp? Oh, I, I, I did hit the sharp, but just. Let's 
Okay, maybe this one will give you the date. Two thousand, year two thousand. All right. So uh, they were first. Uh, this was before it was actually out yet. This, this was at a uh, conference, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and uh, I was sitting there. And you always do when you go to these conferences. You always go to the Microsoft presentations. You know why? They give away the best free crap. You know the smaller companies are giving little bouncy balls and yo-yos and little light-up things. What do you think Microsoft was giving away that year? They were giving away a, a sealed box set of Visual Studio 6.0 Professional. It's like $600 software. Well, we had already all pirated it, right? You know, us students, we, we don't need your legal software. We sold that on eBay. It was the first year eBay was out. <laughs> so they gave me 600 bucks is what they did. I think I got 400 for it or something, but you know. So I, they, they gave me 400 bucks to go and listen to them talk about C Sharp. Uh, past transgressions, I'm past the statute of limitations, I'm sure. Um, or they have to catch me first, one of the two. So in any case, uh, they got up there and they're announcing C Sharp and how great it is. And they basically might as well have been talking about Java. Now, having said that, it would be easy for somebody not in the know to sit there and say, well, they, they basically still stole Java. They just changed some of the syntax so it wasn't identical to Java. But isn't that kind of true when you look at Java versus C++? I mean, Java looks like C++. The syntax is largely identical. So most of these language evolutions are small changes because they're all based on the C programming language. Does that make sense? Okay, they're all based on that guy. So C Sharp was an improvement, all right? And let me show you why here in our last couple of minutes. So have variables, have arrays, we brought back structs. Structs are back. Um, you know what? I'm actually not gonna bring structs back yet. Technically, you could pull off structs in C-sharp, but we're not going to advertise it like that. I want to do that for Swift. All right, so we had our, uh, um, kept our classes, kept our procedures, kept our functions. Now, Java had removed the special syntax for pointers. C-sharp brought back the special syntax for pointers, but only inside of an unsafe code block. So if the programmer wanted to use that special pointer syntax, they could do so, but they had to prove that they knew what they were doing by wrapping that code inside of an unsafe block, saying, look, I realize that bad stuff can happen here. Trust me, I got this. Okay, so as long as you were willing to wrap it inside of an unsafe code block, you were allowed to do pointer crap. Best of both worlds, right? When the pointer stuff makes sense, you can still use it. You just kind of have to have your, you know, your, 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 your uh, green card or whatever, you know, you had the, 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 your, your permission to be able to use it by putting in the unsafe code block. Make sense? All right. So um, that's maybe the big picture. Now let me kind of tee stuff up for next class. So I want to start off, I'm just going to write the first couple slides. Java versus C Sharp there. Then we're going to talk about web languages. And then we're going to make him hold out. Then we're going to talk about Swift. All right. Then we're going to get into variables. All right. So, for next time, if you go into the class, 
under assignments, the first, well, I see more than you see, okay? You will see these two top ones, because notice these other ones are all grayed out, so I see them, you don't. So your first programming, uh, everybody pay attention. One more, you just gotta focus for one more minute, but I promise I'll let you go. And this will help most of your grades if you listen for the next minute. This first programming assignment is to research how to write, compile, and run a typical Hello World program in Java. All right, uh, that is a program that outputs to the screen Hello World. You need to write a detailed tutorial that walks someone new to programming through the process of creating, compiling, and running this program. This tutorial should include screenshots and a step-by-step -step walkthrough of every single step. Remember we focused today on this idea of breaking problems down to little tiny baby steps, something that we suck at as humans. I'm looking for that here, okay? Break it down into the granular little steps. I should be able to have my grandma read this. And at the end of the day, even though she barely knows what a computer is, she should be able to have a running Java Hello World program. That makes sense? So this says, someone with zero programming experience and zero knowledge of Java should be able to follow your tutorial and ultimately get a Hello World program running on their computer. Now, there's two things you're going to find when you go and look at this. You can do a traditional... Java old school way, hello world program, where you use Java to compile it and Java to run it. You write your code in Notepad. That's all. That's good. I don't. That's no problem whatsoever. If you want to go that route, the alternative would be using an IDE, an integrated development environment. There's a couple popular ones you'll see out there. One is called uh, Eclipse. That's the one we'll be using in here, and then the other one's called NetBeans. So you might, in your research, you're going to stumble upon one of those three methods. Okay, I don't care which of those you do, but make sure whichever one you choose, you are extremely detailed with pictures. I need to know where I need to go to download each thing. I need to know how to install it. I need to know what I need to do. I need to know what I need to type. I need to know where I need to store it. All the steps. I should be able to follow your instructions step by step by step by step by step. And in the end, I should see Hello World show up on my screen. That makes sense? I can't tell you how many times I've had to write that this needs to be way more detailed when I'm grading these. So if you want a good grade, be detailed. Second one is a paper, write a three to five page paper covering the role of Java in industry today compared to C Sharp and Objective C. Okay, so Objective C is a language we didn't throw on our chart yet. Uh, it actually lives right over here to the right of C. This was Microsoft, Objective-C was Apple, all right? So I want to compare and contrast uh, um, Java to C-sharp to Objective-C. Your report should cover uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of Java as compared to the other two. Your report should cover, you know, actually, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to be nice to you. How about two to three pages? I want you to spend the time on that first assignment really detailing it, okay? Um, you know, because I'm not doing it just to punish you. It's, this is a, it's, there's a rhyme and a reason to this. All right, um, your report should uh, include a use case describing the career path of a Java developer in the IT industry. We talked about it earlier today that IT does not mean not programming. All right. Uh, what can one expect to be done uh, doing as an entry-level Java developer? What can one expect to be doing as a senior-level Java developer? What are the expectations in the journey between those two positions? All right. Makes sense? So all that's due before 6 p.m. next uh, next week. Okay, like I said, I don't mind if you get together with people and want to work on your detail thing. Just do a good job. Okay? But definitely turn in your own assignments, right? Don't just say, oh yeah, us four worked on something and have, have me have to connect the dots, okay? I'm not going to go and look for cheaters. I don't care. I want you to learn. I want you to get something out of the class. Make sense? Okay. All right. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right. I will see everybody next 
Wednesday. If you do have any questions, though, between now and then, ask them on Slack or you can text me, any of that stuff. So uh, remember, email as well, but make sure you bug me if I don't get back to you right away. It's just cool.